Peggy 12. Well, you tested it to look at it, and we haven't seen anything since the yeah, last time. Since 2004, I have not played I've, Jack. Like, I've watched my nephews play it. <laughs> oh, it does look good. This looks about the same. No. It looks a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> Jack's feel is still great, though. He moves really well. Yeah. Oh, you remember how to play. It's, it's immediate. He knows all the commands still. All the memories come back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so when we sat down and brainstormed after the close of Crash Team Racing and we're looking at the, the PlayStation uh, 2 hardware, we're like, okay, this world has to be seamless. We don't want any loads. It's got to feel immersive and we don't want there to ever be uh, a break from the action or a, a chance for you to say, oh, now's the time for me to put down the controller. I finished that level, you know, and you're just always in the world. It's always on. There's a day and night cycle. So it's, it's always changing and evolving and you really feel like you're part of that world. So those were from the very beginning before we even knew who Jack was, who Daxter was, you know, what the world was going to be like. That was the feeling that we wanted to invoke. Oh, we had everyone draw, too. We had every single artist in the company draw, like, their vision. Like, on paper, like, or on computer, they were allowed to do anything. Draw their vision of, like, the world we might make. I got to see what they were working on. Uh, the characters hadn't even been named yet, you know, it just had like, you know, pictures of Jack said hero and picture of Dax said sidekick. Uh, and then they actually showed me the game in progress and I was completely blown away. Um, not only by the graphics, which looked pretty much better than anything I'd seen on PS2, but the animation of the main characters like Jack and Daxter, uh, John Kim did it all himself and oh my God, it blew my mind. Oh yeah, this, this little space and Jack's cool little waddle, water waddle. <laughs> I love look at Daxter shivering. That was John Kim touch. Daxter was, uh, king, um, I guess, one of the things that I drew as far as inspiration was uh, Abu, mm -hmm. Aladdin Abu. Mm -hmm. He was squirrely, he was, he was literally just all over Jack. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Aladdin is all over uh, the main character. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, and he would do the same thing in, 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 the, in the game. Um, you know, if he does a spin kick, he would spin around him and, and he'll string back and co come back like a rubber band. And uh, so yeah, the, all, all that um, ideas, I think heavily for me as an animator, came from, uh, came from Aladdin. But again, that was a first. Most characters, and still there are games where the characters go in the water and they just walk through the water. Jack had a reaction for everything. Yeah, his animation was pretty unparalleled. And that was something that was very important to us, was that, that, that passion for uh, animation and, and very responsive controls. Um, we all came from uh, the arcade era, and those had a great feel to them, and we wanted to replicate that. The little micro bits of adjustment to get the, the timing right, to get the, the, the motion to work, to get the, you know, the parabola, the arc of that, um, the, when you do your second jump, or when you ledge grab, when does he come out of it. And you also build on shoulders of giants. You know, uh, we looked a lot at uh, the the best in class at the time, 
and Mario was doing some, and continues to do some fantastic stuff. One of the things when I first saw Jack and Daxter, one of the things that really jumped out at me was finally we're doing you know, Mario 64. Because when we were making Crash Bandicoot and Mario 64 came out, we were just like, oh, wow. We were absolutely floored by what, was go what we were seeing on the screen. And so when I, first saw the, when I first saw Jack and Daxter, it was like, okay, you know, now we can do that kind of a game. That this was really Mario 64, but given reason and given continuity. So it wasn't just a bunch of toys, it was here's Jack and, and why do you have to and do And there's this? a story, well, a, Mario had no story. Right, a bird stole it as opposed to just go do it. Yeah, so when Jack and Daxter came out, I think uh, there was a, a lot of excitement um, because it was sort of a PlayStation owner's chance to play um, a game that is more traditionally associated with um, like a Nintendo release. It was pretty nerve wracking because it was really the first thing that I had worked on where I really, truly, genuinely cared about the uh, reviews that it was going to get. And the response overall for the first Jack game was uh, generally really, really positive, you know. It was just uh, fun to uh, be able to uh, you know, play this game with some of my friends or some little cousins. So hey, look, I did this part. We all thought that we, we, we had made something really fun. Uh, and you know, thankfully, uh, the uh, sales demonstrated that enough people agreed with us. <laughs> For us, it's, it's always very refreshing to get the outsider's perspective and to say, wow, this is actually something that works really well. We didn't know we were making such a great title. We were just doing our best to create a kick-ass title. Oh yes, the dogs. Man, this brings back memories. Technically, this was a much, much more challenging project, and so uh, just getting it to run at all was almost a miracle. Yeah, I mean, we were really excited about the opportunity to uh, bring Jack and Daxter to the PlayStation 3 and be able to present it in high definition and up res the graphics and add the trophies and sort of really give it that uh, PS3 experience. But it was gonna be a very daunting challenge. Naughty Dog will probably tell you they told us at the beginning that this is an impossible project. And uh, it wasn't long before we agreed with him. Jack had one of the craziest overall technical schemes like ever. They did a lot of tricks, um, a lot of expected ones and a lot of unexpected ones. They wanted to get the most out of the PS2. Well, actually I would argue they did get the most out of the PS2. We had like completely custom tools and completely custom way of using all the hardware. We made stuff back and forth between all the different processors and like did weird stuff on the, the old PlayStation 1 processor you weren't supposed to and it was just a very complicated design. So the, the process of handing it off to another developer, um, Mass Media, who did a fantastic job of piecing together that, that spaghetti. And looking under the hood, yes, it was a surprise to see that much code. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let me just say that to them right now. Uh, lots of late night debugging sessions and, and mysteries that took a few days to solve. Yeah, it wouldn't, we didn't think when we were making the game of the people that would come through and improve the game. I was there sitting next to the programmer helping him figure out what kind of clever algorithm that Naughty Dog came up with. Of course, it's at those points you realize how much work you're going to be in for and you've got to try and figure out how they did this uh, multi-textured multi, multi -textured layered rendering. Oh, brilliant, but troublesome. Even going back to some previous idea or some previous thing that we implemented, it's hard even like for me to go back and like, what were we thinking? Like, I don't know why we did it that way, but it made sense at the time. <laughs> and then we moved on, you know? So Naughty Dog just had a way of going in and figuring out the last possible ounce of power you could get out of these systems. And that was just what we did. So how else would you do no, it? No, yeah, yeah, how, yeah. How, no, else I... would you, how else would you torture programmers? <laughs> Oh, you can find a lot of ways. We try to, <laughs> I'm sure you're still finding them. I'm not surprised, like it was kind of like, um, maybe one of the toughest things that they had to do at mass media, but like, uh, yeah, we just, uh, they did it.
we could have gone the route of doing a lot more rewriting than we did, but we didn't want to do that because we wanted to keep the essence of the game. We wanted to make sure it was the game. I'd, I'd say 100% we are, we are faithful to the original. And, and like restoring old film, the people that do that, they have, um, they're driven. They have a cause and they're trying to make the best job possible because, because it's a labor of love. And so when you see classics like this, you absolutely want to bring it into the modern era. You want new people to see it. And you've got to take care. Absolutely. It's like, uh, you know, remixing the Beatles album or something. I mean, it's cool. It, it's just totally awesome because we all loved this game. I loved it when it came out. I mean, you remember the game. It always looked great and it was always super colorful and cool. You play the PS3 for a while and go back to it. It's like, wow, that's... That's a little different than I remembered it. So it's, it's funny how your memories work on there. Uh, I think to some certain extent you kind of remaster your memories. And so then when you play the PS3, hopefully it matches pretty good. <laughs> The nostalgia of it and the people that played it 10 years ago are going to be the people that are going to buy this and just like, wow, you know, this is cool. But there is a whole nother generation or, uh, you know, at this point I feel like I'm so old that maybe a few generations back that are going to be looking at this stuff for the first time and thinking, well, this is, you know, this is the kind of game that people don't hardly make anymore. I mean, you know, these days it's, it's big movie kind of uh, adventure titles. Or, or big battle games or whatever, and, and these, this was a time when it really was all about platform <laughs> games and, uh, and that kind of gameplay, puzzle solving, that uh, was very simplistic but, but compelling. And that actually means a lot to me that people still like want to play this game, you know? So that's, pre that's pretty refreshing to see that right on, the game we made 10 years ago is still being played right now. So that's actually really, really cool. We work so hard on these games and at the time that they come out, I mean, they're state of the art. I mean, they're just, you know, people are just clamoring that day one, this is it. This is, this is, this is the state of the, of the industry right here. Um, but then they have a tendency to, to fade. You have people's memories and they talk about it, but they don't really get a chance to really go back and, and, and play them. And that's something that um, is difficult in, with video games are because it's often tied to a hardware. Um, that once that hardware is obsolete, then that game dies with it. Um, and so to be able to kind of keep that going um, forever is, is definitely something that I, I wish we could just keep doing and, and I think we'll always go back to those classic games. There's, there's always going to be a time in our life, uh, there was a time in our gaming life, I guess, that we will never forget. And there's you know, a period of time that just has a certain nostalgia to it. Um, that we will always kind of go back to, so. Oh, Jesus, I suck. Oh, I suck, I suck, I suck, I suck. It's gonna be fun, I'm, I'm really looking forward to sitting down and I get permission every once in a while to just do some game time at home. And this, I'm sure I'll get some uh, permission to dive right in. I, I wanna play these again from start to finish. Which is kind of ridiculous, but, <laughs> but that's that's what I'm gonna do. The only thing that will be difficult, I think, for some people is, you know, for all the cleaning up that they uh, do and the graphics and all that sort of stuff, all the stuff that drove us crazy when we released the game is still gonna be there. Like all the stuff that we didn't get to do, all the animations that we kind of had to like skimp on because we were rushing to get things done. I mean, all that stuff's just still gonna be there. So, like they say, projects are never finished, they're simply abandoned, because you gotta ship the damn thing, right? So, so you know, there'll be, there'll be a few things that uh, you'll be like, oh man, but and the bottom line is, it's gonna be cool to be able to experience that stuff again. There's a pain in creation in the game industry, and there's a lot of, of late nights, a lot of frustration, things get to yells, things get to anger. Uh, there's a lot of pain in the creation of these games. And to turn around and play it for fun right after that is impossible because the pain still rises. You still get frustrated. Oh, I lost that battle. Oh, we never fixed this thing. Oh, it still has this problem. Oh, how did we leave that in? You don't see it as a gamer sees it. You see as a game maker sees it. We create the games that we wanna play, but they end up being for somebody else. You know, it's just making games, it's just a lot of like personal investment. It's like, uh, and it's kind of like what we're also asking people to do here. It's like, you're gonna, 
spend a lot of time at the office. You're gonna just give it a lot of yourself uh, just to, to do it. And singing now, it's singing, it's still like, an, there are great games. You're like, it was worth it. It was totally worth it. Takes a while. Yeah, and to, actually, although I was having fun playing Jack, and so I do, I do want to sit down and play because it's been ten years now. So that's like about the the right kind of distance you need to like to look at it like fairly objectively, where you've half forgotten the stuff. So I can now play the game as the audience that speaks to me on Twitter or whatever reaches out to me, says how fantastic the game is. I can play it and see it as they saw it. I receive oh, I at least an email like or message or two a day asking for updates to Jack or a Jack Four, and that's. That doesn't sound like a lot, but there's no reason to send it to me because I no longer have any control over it. And people know that. It's not like they think I still work at Naughty Dog. So the, the demand for this is, is big. And I tell everybody that the, the day I left Naughty Dog was the day that I couldn't, couldn't defeat anyone in uh, Goldeneye. <laughs> well, you know, there, there was a road and it branched. And one branch was continue to work at Naughty Dog and continue to do something that I love doing and still look back on very fondly. And the other branch was to go do things that weren't coming into the office every day, six or seven days a week, working extremely long hours and trying to make myself a more full person by traveling, doing other businesses, finding out about other, uh, other companies, other industries. Uh, and I chose that branch. And we were lucky to have like, uh, guys we work with like them who were so talented who actually were capable of like really doing it and doing their own thing and adding their own style to it. It's actually, you know, they're very unique. There was no stumble at Naughty Dog. Naughty Dog continued right along into Game of the Years. So it's easy to look back and say, I shouldn't have made this decision or I should have made this decision, um, but I wouldn't give up the life you know, that I've led since. Um, but it's when you come back on a day like this and the memories come rushing back and you do realize that you, you, know, you miss that familial um, challenge. What else there is to say? I just actually want to go play them. <laughs>